know that one of the earliest symbols of the church is a ship. Part of the church building where you're sitting right now, where you gather for worship, was called the nave, or the place in a ship that was the safest, the most protected from the stormy waves of the sea. That image of a ship is a comforting one. Over the years, it's, it's morphed into what we call now the sanctuary, a place where God's children can find safety and protection from the evils and the dangers of the world all around. You're here this morning because you booked passage on that ship. And as we meet in this place Sunday after Sunday, we see all sorts of different places that that ship takes us on our journey of faith together. During October, we rode along on the stewardship. We were challenged to discover a vision of how God has called us to best use our resources of of time and talent and treasure to grow in faith and reach out to the world with the good news of Jesus. Last week we booked passage on the leadership and we explored what it means for us to lead by serving others and not by lording our, our power over them. And so today the discipleship is waiting at the dock ready for us to board. No steps in life are any more important than the ones that you take to cross that gangplank and onto this vessel. Being a disciple is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. Being a disciple means jumping in with both feet. Being a disciple means making a commitment. It means prioritizing your lives so that folks can see Jesus living in you. Being a disciple means taking seriously God's call for you to board the ship. The story we just read together talks about people who had one foot on the dock and the other foot on the deck of the ship. And that ship is about ready to pull away from the shore. Which way are the people going to jump? Last week you heard about how the tribes of Israel split into two nations. Ten tribes went north with Jeroboam and kept the name Israel, and they formed the northern kingdom. The remaining two tribes stayed with King Rehoboam, and they formed Judah, or the southern kingdom. Its capital was Jerusalem with its kings of, in the line of David and Solomon. Today's story that we read together takes place in that northern kingdom. <coughs> Things that have continued to go down to go downhill. The king Ahab has married Jezebel, a woman from outside the kingdom and the faith. She's a worshiper of Baal, the Phoenician god of thunderstorms. And to keep her happy, Ahab built a temple for her god right in the middle of Samaria, his capital city. And he's encouraged his subjects to worship Baal right along with the god of Israel. And as you might imagine, that does not bode too well. Wasn't there something in the Ten Commandments about worshiping God and God alone? Something would have to give. So we enter into the story of Elijah, who becomes one of the great prophets in the history of the people of God. There's going to be a time of reckoning, and you heard me read about this showdown that took place on Mount Carmel. Elijah versus 450 prophets of Baal sent from the court of Queen Jezebel. And the people of Israel are in the stands that people who have one foot in the boat and the other foot on the dock. People who are limping along in two different opinions. And Elijah challenges them to choose. Either get into the ship or stay on the shore. This is a story about the claim that God places on all of our lives to follow. What does following God look like? You know from the story what following Baal looks like. The prophets built an altar and they sacrificed this offering that was specially suited to please Baal alone. They danced, they shouted around that altar all morning long, hoping that Baal would hear them and send down one of his famous lightning bolts 
and light up the fire that was on, to light up the offering that was on the altar. They did this all morning long and nothing happened. And Elijah makes fun of them and their God from the sidelines. He says, maybe your God has dozed off. Maybe he's gone for a walk. So they changed their tactics and they whipped themselves into a frenzy to try and get Baal's attention. The scripture says they even cut themselves until blood must have been flying all over the place. Anything to look faithful, anything they could do to try and show their devotion, even to the point of inflicting pain on themselves. And by the end of the day, these 450 prophets were exhausted and limping around the altar. But it was pretty clear that they were followers of Baal because they had all the marks of Baal's prophets all over them. And in the face of all of that, Elijah challenges the people of Israel to take a good look at the gods that they have chosen to follow. And here's the thing, you know, these, these folks considered themselves to be extremely religious. They worshiped Yahweh, the Lord God, on the Sabbath. They worshiped Baal on Monday. They worshiped Ashtar on Tuesday. And who knows what other deities on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. What kind of devotion can you top that with? This is what it takes to be a follower and be a religious person in their eyes. And that kind of devotion takes its toll. Because that which you worship makes a claim on your life in return. Discipleship has a cost. For the prophets of Baal, there was a physical cost. As we saw, sometimes it's brutal. By cutting themselves, they carry the scars of their worship. Is that the kind of God that you want to follow? It's not a big jump from Mount Carmel to some of the practices of Muslim extremists today. But could you buy into a faith community that measures devotion to their God by a willingness to take one's own life along with a crowd of innocent people? That's not a God I have any interest in serving. But you know, we do serve all sorts of different gods that make some demands on our lives. Gods that make requirements of us. Gods that mark us as parts of their congregations. In some ways, those gods possess us, and they take over our lives. I've known folks who have invested in things like boats and campers and, and then felt compelled to make the best use of that money spent by spending their weekends on the lake or in the mountains, and their possessions end up possessing them. Look at stadiums that are filled weekend after weekend with fans who wouldn't dream of being anywhere else. And sometimes those fans mark themselves just as distinctively as any prophet of Baal. And in the end, end up just as discouraged when they limp home after their team loses. Now, you, you let me know when I move from preaching into meddling. <laughs> but Elijah calls the people to make a choice. Where will they put their allegiance? Their total allegiance. Will it be with Baal? Or will it be with the Lord God of Israel? The people could see what allegiance to Baal looked like. The bleeding prophets living around an altar that went untouched by the lightning of the god of thunderstorms. <laughs> There's not much there to follow. So Elijah calls on the Lord and the water-soaked offering he's prepared is burned to a crisp in an instant. And what's the people's response? They become quite interested. The Lord is God indeed. The Lord is God indeed. They can't hop on the bandwagon fast enough. But really, what other choice, what other response could they make? There's, there's really no other choice that they could make. If not God, then who? Who is even close? And what does our allegiance to God look like? What does the Lord require of us? Years later, another prophet, Micah, answered that question. He said that the Lord requires of us to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. 
That's the lens that you and I look through as disciples if we're all in with God. If we've jumped in with both feet, then justice and kindness and humility will color everything that we do. And we will begin to have an impact on the world around us. God will shine through you. Tough choices and decisions will start to become a lot clearer because your priorities of how you use your time and your talent and your treasures will naturally fall into place. Now, if you're a numbers person, let me put it another way. And if, if numbers aren't your friend, don't be afraid because I'm just going to use two. Number one and number zero. Now, in your mind, picture a sheet of notebook paper, and in the upper left-hand corner, write God and assign God the number one. And then start making your list, as long a list as you want, or as you need, of all the activities or choices or things in your life that you need to prioritize. And give each one of those choices or those activities a zero. And then you can begin to put your list together. You can start creating a number using that number one and all those zeros, and you can put your decimal point right before the first number. And if you play with all of your zeros and try and fit the one in amongst them somewhere, you'll see that the value of the number keeps changing depending on where you move that one. It might be one-tenth, it might be one one-thousandth, it might be one millionth. And the value of the one will be lost in all that shifting of the priorities according to the choices that you make in life. But if the number one is the first number that you place to the right of that decimal point, it doesn't matter how many zeros that you add, the value of the number will remain the same. Nothing is going to change it. Discipleship means putting an end to limping along in life. Trying to decide who is in charge. Discipleship is a call to stop the endless shuffling of the zeros and put God, the number one, in front. And there's a promise that if we do that, God will light a fire in our lives. God will light a fire in the church. And God will be seen as we do justice as we seek kindness and as we walk humbly with him. So let's be bold today. Let's take a step. Let's jump in with both feet and let the fire fall. And may our response be, the Lord is God indeed. The Lord, the Lord is God indeed. Amen. Would you pray with me? Loving God, thank you. Thank you for your word to us. Words in a fascinating story that reaches out and grabs hold of us and reminds us of your strength and your power and your call that you should be number one in our lives. That's a challenge, oh Lord. Empowered by your spirit, help us to accept it. Let your fire burn within us. We pray to